Hello everyone, welcome back. So let's jump into some examples of what we learned so far. So what we have here is a steel T-shape and it's used to support the loads shown on the beam. And the dimensions of this shape are shown right here. Okay, we're considering the entire 24 foot length of the beam. What we wanna know is what's the maximum tension bending stress at any location along the beam and the maximum compression bending stress at any location along the beam. And we'll do this first one together and then the next ones I'll let you have more time to try on your own. But of course, since this is a video, so you can pause and do what you wish. <laughs> but let's go ahead and jump right into this problem. So you can see this is kind of combining what we learned in chapter seven and chapters eight now. So the first thing we need to figure out is what is the centroid location in the y direction? So we go back to this shape where we have the T shape, okay, so we've got like a nice wide flange on the top and then we have the stem. Those would be two easy shapes to work with. So that's probably what we'll do. So looking at it, the top flange will have an area of 24 inches and the stem will have an area of 13.875 inches. And then the distance to their centroid is gonna be simply half the height for the stem and then for the top flange, it's going to be half its height, which is only half an inch, I believe, um, plus the 19 inches from the previous, plus the 19 inches from the previous one. Okay. Now let's make sure I did everything right there. I don't want to lead you wrong. Ah, I was a bit off. This is 18 and a half inches, so it'd be 18 and a half plus 0.75. Okay, I knew I remembered something interesting. I like this. We then multiply them together as we've done so many times before and we add them to get the total here and the sum here so we can plug it into our centroid equation. Which says that the centroid is 15.5866 inches from the bottom or 4.413 inches from the top. You can use either one as long as you're consistent. Now what about the moment of inertia? Well, it's going to be simply the moment of inertia of each of those shapes, and we're going to add them together. Now, the top flange has a very, very small moment of inertia around its own centroid, and the stem has a much larger one because it's much taller. However, we see that the top flange has a very large component due to the distance from the centroidal axis, the actual centroid of the whole built up section. And so it does still have a significant contribution to the overall moment of inertia. So these are the distances from each of their centroids to the central location. And in this case, we're doing it from the top. Measuring things from the top, though it doesn't really matter how you do it. Okay, so we add them together, what we get is 1,279 is our moment of inertia in inches to the fourth power. Now we actually have to look at our beam. So we start making our shear force and bending diagrams because it's probably the easiest way to do it. So first off, first off, we look at this right here and we have to say, okay, how does everything move? Well, luckily for us at the ends, what you see is that, wait a minute, there's no supports. And you're right, there's only supports in the center. So we have to stop at zero. So right here at this point, we go, it's gonna be at zero. And then after that, we're going to jump up 17 kips. Why 17 kips up? Well, my shear force is resisting this load. It's going the opposite direction. Okay, so I go 17 kips until I reach this point where I have my reaction force, which is 62 kips. And then I will suddenly jump down 62 kips because I'm resisting that. And then this is a nice constant um, distributed load, and because of that, it's going to increase linearly with distance. The load I feel is going to increase linearly with distance. But it's simply the load times the distance, which is going to be the slope of a line. And it will increase all the way up to here. Then we're going to jump up 16, up to 31, go over to our next support, we'll jump down 38, go to the next 7, and what do you know? We'll be right back to zero. So we start from one side and go to the other one you can solve. The only big thing you have to do here for math wise is figuring out what are these reaction forces? What are these reaction forces? 
probably the hardest thing for this. And to do that, you're simply doing, you know, your sum of the forces in the y direction and some of the moments about a particular point. As for our bending moment diagram, it's a little bit harder to write, but it's still not terrible. Because remember, the slope of this line is equal to my shear force. So my slope is negative 7, and I do that for 6 feet, so I go from 0 down to negative 42. Then my slope is positive 31 for 4 feet, so 31 times 4 is equal to 124. And so I go from 42 all the way up to 82. This gets a bit wonky, and that's really hard to write, because that will be a polynomial function. So that's a bit painful, but that's the reason that we went ahead and calculated this. It's the reason that we went ahead and calculated this. Why? Because we can figure out at least how high I have gone um, in that time frame. So from this point to here, I know that this area on the curve is how much my moment has gone up. So I don't have to have the perfect, like every single point along that line known. I just need to know the maximum. The maximum will happen when my shear force crosses the zero right here. And then it will keep on decreasing down to negative 68. If I want to know how it decreased, I can simply take the area right here and figure out how much it's gone down from 100.75. And then it will go straight back up to zero because this is nice and flat and constant. Okay, we've looked at that, so now let's calculate our maximum bending moments. So the maximum positive moment is 100.75, the maximum negative is negative 68, right here and right here respectively. And we can then calculate our bending stresses at those points. We get 4.17 um, KSI compressive for the positive bending moment and 14.73 KSI in tension for the negative bending moment. For the negative bending moment. Oh, sorry, not the negative bending moment, it's still for the positive bending moment, but just at the bottom. Okay. So we now have our max tension bending stress. And we can do the exact same thing to figure out our max compressive bending stresses, because just because we had a higher moment last time does not mean that it's going to necessarily have the highest compressive stress because the sign right here was switched. Um, before, we still had negative 15.5866, but we had a positive number, and so this led to a tensile stress. This time it's leading to a compressive stress. You're always gonna see the maximums the farther away you get from the centroid. So I believe that's everything for this time. It is, yes. So we're gonna stop here, and next time we'll jump into some examples with the transformed section method. So thank you for listening. I hope this helps you, and I'll see you all later. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.